Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Connect Inspire Share number five uh, for the year. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to um, uh, introduce uh, today's session, which I will do in just a moment after I give our uh, acknowledgement of country. Um, okay, I can't do that while I'm, can't minimize while I'm recording, really. Okay. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all are today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm speaking to you, uh, me, I'm speaking to you right now from Boonarung land. So please feel free to tell us in the chat uh, where you are uh, joining us from today, on which land you're joining us from today. Um, it gives me real pleasure to uh, introduce our um, speakers today. Uh, Morag Burney is a learning strategist in academic skills at Unimelb with over 14 years of teaching experience. Uh, Morag's key areas of interest include digital education, the potential for students as partners programs to enhance professional practice, teaching and learning, strategies to embed in language instruction in content delivery and academic integrity. Uh, she's joined today by student partners uh, Tinsu uh, Lee, uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, beg your pardon, God, that's in my head, see ya, and Yu Chi, uh, Annie Dai. I'll let them introduce themselves and perhaps tell us what courses they're studying. All right, um, I'll go first. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Tin Su, and I'm a second year biomedicine student. Um, and I joined the Students as Partners program at the start of this year. Thank you. Um, maybe I can go next. So hi everyone, my name is Yue Tsi, or you can call me Annie. I am a uh, third year design student studying digital technologies, which kind of related to what we do as part of the student program. And I joined this um, program in the beginning of the year, um, the same time as Tin Su. Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl. I'm a third year student as well, like Annie, and I'm in the Bachelor of Science program, and my major is Neuroscience. I also joined the Student as Partners program at the start of the year. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll let Morag introduce, uh, get the talk started, not just introduce it, but uh, she's going to give us a lot of information about this wonderful Student Partners program we have at um, Melbourne University. So without any further talk from me, Morag, it's over to you. Mm, not that Steve's biased or anything, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you about this program. It's something I'm very passionate about. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to, to share this with you. Um, the, uh, go. Um, so I think the format's pretty standard. We'll be doing about 25 minutes. You'll hear from me and the student partners, then some discussion questions, um, followed by some question and answer. Um, so this program is about three years old, it's something we launched in 2020, which as everyone knows is the perfect time to launch new programs. Uh, originally designed as the face-to-face, -face, we had to transition very quickly into to online. Um, Hi. Um, so it was a result of wanting to change the way that we've worked with students. We've, as I'm sure you all do, worked with students in some capacity for as long as I can remember. We wanted to try and shift the way that we worked with them by engaging in more of a partnership program. So when we set up the program, because <laughs> resourcing and funding is always a struggle, it is a voluntary program. We ask students to commit to 20 hours per semester. The focus is on helping us to develop academic English language intercultural and professional skills resources and services as that's the main focus in our team. Since 2020 we've had 75 students across undergraduate coursework, international domestic, um, remote on campus, so um, quite, quite diverse. Most staff in the team have been involved in some kind of work with student partners um, over the past few years. We've had counted up about 25 different projects that we've uh, that we've completed from really big projects right down to sort of small ones. And one of the main things that our student partners do is work with us on our orientation 
programs. So they help us to co-facilitate design and, and deliver those sessions. When we set the program up, one of the main goals for us was to consider this um, principle of reciprocity. So this diagram is um, from the Higher Education Academy framework for student engagement through partnership. Um, we chose to focus on reciprocity because we felt like we've been benefiting from listening to students for a long time, but we weren't necessarily helping the students to benefit in the same way. So we wanted to focus in on that um, equal, equal benefit from the partnership. So we wanted to begin to work more systematically and consistently with students in the hope that we would be able to develop the trust required to move away from those traditional hierarchies where we said, we've created a thing, what do you think about it? Um, and really move towards them getting some, some real experience and real benefit out of it. And also us as well. I think beforehand we were very focused on improving a product, whereas now we've actually shifted to really focus in on what are we actually learning from the students that we're working with and through these processes as well. So I think there are probably um, four key learnings. Um, for anyone who went to STARS a couple of years ago, I've, I've sort of gone back through and updated um, some of those learnings that we, we presented on then. Um, it's really, really important to shift that change in perspective. Um, and it, it sounds quite straightforward and quite easy, but um, moving away from the way that you've always worked with students and how it, you've managed to fit it into your workload it is a bit of a challenge. Um, one of the ways we did that when we set up the program was we, um, we set out really clear program goals. We discussed those with the team, we're very open. We provided guidelines around how to work with students, what type of activities were fit with partnership and what, what didn't. Um, we sought expressions of interest rather than insisting that everyone came and worked with us. We asked the team to contribute to projects, to suggestions, to training um, in any way that they could, recruitment, selection. Um, in the beginning, we also had very regular catch-ups, I think fortnightly catch-ups for anyone involved in working with students as partners so that we had almost like a staff support group for um, issues and challenges that were arising on our side. Um, we overtly focused on the reciprocal benefits. Um, we kept asking, you know, what are you getting from this and tried to bring that front of mind. Uh, we were lucky enough to formalize the program as well um, within the first year. It became just a part of our offering, it went on our website. Um, we moved from pilot into this is something we're going to continue to do. Uh, and the support from management to do that was, um, was really important. And I guess, you know, sharing successes and learnings um, at team meetings and and bringing it into team discussions um, regularly. Um, it just opened up the space for discussion around things people weren't sure about and how to work with students. I think to update this three years in, um, this isn't something you do once and then kind of move on. I think it's what's clear is now that we really need to provide ongoing support for that shift in perspective um, because when the cohorts change, the workloads change, teams change, you have new people coming in. Um, a lot of that knowledge and practice it sometimes disappears, especially we've had quite a bit of change in our team over the past few years and the way that we're working is very different. Um, so it's constant, constant reinforcement, um, I think, be the message and a champion. I really think having a champion in this space um, helps to, to keep that keep that on track. I think the second learning is that you have to create a space for growth for both parties. Um, we did this with workshops in that we took a start from scratch approach. Um, we sort of refined this over the, the period of time as well. What we didn't want was people sharing past slides, past work, um, didn't really open up a space for creativity for the students. What we wanted to do was get people to go back, talk about the topics. What would, how would you contribute to this? How would you structure this? What would you do? Really make that an equal, equal partnership. Um, so we developed together. So we we set up a little process for this, 
um, in which we encourage um, anyone working with students on workshops to meet uh, face to face or asynchronously. We refer them and work with our workshop principles document, um, make sure they plan, design, practice, and then close that gap with feedback. We actually added the feedback this year based on feedback that we got uh, earlier this semester. Um, and I think that process is working, working really well, but some of those aspects did really need to be articulated. Um, and obviously this uh, does become a challenge with, with resourcing. This is a much more time consuming process than um, having a student pop in and answer a few questions and then, and then move on out. When we set up the program, the workshops are a bit of a no brainer um, because we've worked with students in workshops as well. That was about tweaking at what stage we involved them in the development. We decided to focus on projects because that seemed like the most logical space for us to find an opportunity where both parties could benefit and grow. So we were looking for any opportunities we could find where there were gaps um, in skills or knowledge on either side that the other side could fill or work together to fill. Complementary experience, skills, knowledge, um, based on sort of the resources and times and motivations of staff and students as well. So we wanted to keep it sort of flexible. Um, and that led us to a huge variety of different styles and lengths of projects um, we've tried over the few, few years that we've been running. Um, so some projects are student driven, some are staff driven. What we found in the first year is that we, a scaffolding approach kind of worked much better where the staff sort of took more responsibility in the first semester. Um, we developed some project management training, project management skills, and then that enabled in the second semester students to put forward their own ideas for projects and take more ownership of leading and running them. Um, but of course, these have changed with the um, resourcing that we have uh, and the cohort, the student cohorts that we have as well. So I think you need to create that space, space, but it needs to be really flexible. Um, and one of the tips I think one of the students in the session here gave the other day is to really focus on the skills and knowledge and interests and motivations that the students in that particular cohort are bringing and then try to, to fit the projects around those as well. But obviously time, cohort, resourcing, huge factors. Um, in creating this type of space. I'm going to pass over now to our student partners to talk to you a little bit about some of the projects that they've been involved in this year uh, and um, what they think about the way that we're working, what they and the partnership sort of approach that we've taken um, and any sort of reflections and tips on how we could uh, do this better. Annie, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so for last semester, I was mainly um, participating in the digital resources program. Um, it's basically um, every fortnightly we, we get a post in Teams. Uh, it, it will be from like library uh, stuff or from academic skills in general. And we'll be asked to give feedbacks on certain page or certain um, service that uni the university provides. And um, because last semester I was doing that remotely, um, although I really appreciate the chance like for me to um, review the materials that I've been using probably for a long time and I don't really have a chance to talk about what I, uh, what I feel about the project, uh, but um, I do feel like uh, it might work better um, if we can have like a face-to-face -face focus group discussion uh, on the digital resources. Um, it would feel better if we could brainstorm together on a whiteboard um, because the interaction is more natural in that way. Yeah, so that's that's what I thought about last semester's uh, program. All right, I think you're on mute. Yep. Okay, Tinsu, would you like to comment on any of the workshops or programs that you've contributed on? 
Yeah, sure. So um, I was involved both with the project work with the digital resources and with co-facilitating um, sessions for orientation. Um, and I guess it was it was really good, actually. I had a really good experience in sharing insights with staff members, um, I guess, at a equal level rather than a, a sort of a hierarchical type structure. Um, and I found that the staff really took us, um, our ideas and suggestions on board and really turned into a shared conversation about resources and how they could be improved or developed. Um, and I think especially with the facilitating the sessions, I felt like there was a lot of emphasis on student perspective and contribution um, from the initial planning stages right up to the day of the session itself. And I think that was really refreshing because um, again, I think Annie sort of alluded to this, um, sometimes it can just feel like we're being asked to give feedback and we're not really contributing to the final product. Um, but I felt that with the sessions, it was really nice to sort of be there from the beginning all the way to the very end. So it was a really good experience. Thank you. Um, Cheryl? Yep. So similar to Tinsu and Annie, I was able to work with the um, designing um, online resources in semester one. And I really like the structure of that because for the um, first round of projects, it was a lot of remote um, challenges. So it was working with stuff remotely. And I felt that that helped me ease into the in-person, working with stuff in person for semester two. And um, examples of projects I did was the research project and the student blogs, um, which is currently ongoing. And what I liked most from them would be the ability to work with stuff as a one-to-one -one basis. So I feel like as students, we are more used to receiving from stuff, but we don't really get the opportunity to um, collaborate with them. So I felt like that was my main takeaway from those two projects. And I also really liked how we were able to apply our own academic skills from uni in general. So things like reviewing literature, um, thinking critically about evidence and applying that to an actual project with actual outcomes. So that was the main um, highlight from my experience with the um, Student as Partners program. I would definitely agree with Cheryl because um, I also did a co-facilitation for the workshop this semester. And um, I think it was with Grace, uh, a staff from Academic Skills, and we designed the whole workshop from scratch. It was about uh, uh, in-class discussions, and I think it really gave me a chance to reflect on the experiences I might never um, had a chance to talk about. And it feels great to know that they can, uh, like my experience might be able to help others. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, yeah, so yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so um, the um, Tinsley, Cheryl, and, and Annie will be here to answer some more questions and, and things later if you've got specific questions about the, the process. I think from a staff perspective, all I'll add is that um, I think all of my colleagues would agree that we've learned a great deal through that process of, of working with students and new ways of looking at things. Um, and different perspectives, ways of approaching things. Um, and it's really refreshed our, our practice. Uh, I think everyone would agree with that. Um, okay, so there's, I think there's a, a really, really wide variety of projects that you can approach. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, one of the learnings has, has been that they need to be quite sort of flexible and fit with the students and the, the staff availability and resourcing that you you have and the motivations that you you have at the time and that it's a bit to juggle juggle that um, but any opportunities to sort of truly collaborate on those projects and come at it from complementary perspectives is, is um, generally has a really really great sort of outcome um, third learning I think for us is um, focusing on the process um, when reflecting back on what we've learned and what we've got out of this, um, a lot of it is, is, is reminding ourselves to focus on the process rather than the, the product or the end outcome. I think it's a given that when you've got that collaboration, the end product is going to be better. Um, and I think 
uh, some some of the feedback that we got from the projects we ran this semester are were a little bit. Um, for example, Annie mentioned the asynchronous nature of a lot of the projects. They were run sort of online rather than face to face um, because of resourcing requirements. And some of the feedback we got was it felt a bit more like focused on the product and the outcome rather than the actual process of working together and, and teasing things out. That that's been an important learning and something we'll take and um, make changes for in the future. I, I think what we found is that it takes the time, the space and experience to build that, that trust and confidence and um, the relationships that you build with the students when you are working quite closely with them um, really, really develop over time. And we did notice as well, like um, the need for support or sort of approval that we, we saw early on really, really lessens as well as students realize we are listening to them and we do value their opinion and we are actually learning from them. I think you heard that from our students here. Um, there's a couple of comments there. I'll just give you a minute to, to read those. I really love this one about my position as a student being reversed. That's exactly what we were hoping <laughs> would happen. All right. Um, and I think the, the final learning, and our, maybe our students want to add something here as well, is how important that communication, evaluation, and reflection is. Um, much like we do in our teaching practice every day, this isn't a program you can set up with activities that you just run, you set and forget. It's constant, um, constant process of uh, keeping communication channels open, um, reflecting. There's lots of meetings and project meetings, um, focus groups, surveys, reflecting on what, what worked and what didn't work and um, building. I think over the past few years, we've tried lots and lots of different things and um, have sort of reflected on all of them and made some changes and I think we're finally getting to a model that that works really well. Um, in terms of other things we've really learned is, uh, and we've refined a lot, um, I'd say that would be um, around communicating expectations. We've done a lot to tighten up um, communications around, especially project work, what's required, when it's required, the number of hours and resources committed and, and when. Um, and really sort of tightening up some of the documentation around what's required has made it a lot clearer. And I think that's that's something that's really helped everyone to understand whether or not they can commit and what the commitments are. Do you have anything you'd like to add about, about this? No? Okay, all right. So I think those are probably the four main, main learnings that we, we've had. The future goals for the program, I think, um, how can we continue to encourage partnership approach within our resourcing constraints? Um, I think where we have had drop off in project proposals and staff working with, with students, it's really around workload and timing. So really thinking about how we can fit this in and make this um, a part of our work. Also considering how can we expand the program sustainably, we've been trying to work with the library um, to see if we can extend the program in that way. Um, and always the question of what can we do to achieve greater diversity and inclusivity um, within the program in our recruitment and um, selection. So, I think that's that's kind of the end of um, the presentation around what we've what we've done and what we've learned. I think we have a um, couple of discussion questions for the breakout room, or I'm happy to take any specific questions now. Um, what we might do, Morag, if it's okay, <clears throat> we do have one in chat, which is around: um, is this paid or volunteer? Or voluntary? Yeah, or voluntary. We have no money. <laughs> 
<laughs> they do it for the, for the good of their hearts <laughs> and the benefit of others. <laughs> purely altruistic program mm -hmm. um but do save up your questions and discussion points uh please for um post uh breakout room discussion um i've put us all into um uh breakout rooms which i'm going to uh, uh release okay. in a moment and i will put okay. the two i'll put the two questions um into uh, chat in the breakout rooms once you're in there uh, using the broadcast. But the two questions there that Morag has posed for us is what does or would true staff, student staff partnership look like in your team areas? That's one of the things we really had to go through is to re-analyze and reflect led by Morag on what that looks like and what it means. And it does require a fundamental shift. So that should provide some healthy discussion and what that shift might look like. Um, and how would you set up such a program? Um, so if you actually have some practical questions for Morag about literally how this program is set up, like how do you get the student group in it? Do you interview them? Do you have an assessment set of, set of activities? How do you do it? Um, that could be a, a good uh, question if you like, if you're interested in setting up a, a program like that. Okay, so I'm um, just about to, I'll pause the... Okay, so um, I might kick off with a question of my own, Morag, if that's okay. Um, and if you have questions, put up your little virtual hand and you can unmute yourself and ask, or by all means, pop them in chat and we'll get, we'll get to them. Um, so Morag, um, you talked about that idea of the equal partnership, which I find, I found really fascinating, that movement, the way we moved as staff from viewing the students as coming in and helping us to actual co-creation. Uh, and real co-creation. I, I found that really empowering for us as well as them, not just for them, but for us too. But I wonder in a sense, does it does it raise the expectations of what we expect from the student partners then? If we're talking about now equal input, are we expecting more? Do our expectation bar, does it raise? Um, I think it, it, it depends on the expectations are, but certainly the the involvement that a student partner might have in a process um, would be greater um, because, you know, to, to, to use the example of the workshops again, rather than saying, hey, can you come in and give three tips on time management? Mm. You're actually sitting down with that student and saying, we actually need to get together and spend an hour planning and then we're going to, you know, we're going to work together to put it together and develop it and deliver it. So it's, um, it's, there's certainly probably more work on both sides i would say yeah. i mean that the the concept is that the partnership comes everyone contributes equally but in different ways so um I, I think um one of the i think in talking about expectations one of the things that we found especially in the beginning was we are we have to remember that we're bringing students from an academic into a professional environment and initially there were a few tensions around um, particularly communication expectations um, and we didn't make those professional communication expectations explicit. Like, like what, for example? Uh, around meeting attendance or responding to messages or, you know, that, that type of thing where, you know, what to do if you can't make a meeting or what to, how we typically respond to, to emails and the time periods and, and things like that. So it's just some sort of, um I guess workplace professional etiquette that is just assumed knowledge because we've all been in the workplace just for example does that wow. answer your question oh it does it does because part of the expectations yeah is around what we can expect in the professional space so to speak um particularly if we're saying hey you're equal partners in this and, and I think it's it's okay to raise our expectations along with theirs being raised of us and, and themselves. And I think that what you talked about, the idea of professional learning, I, I found was great because it, it, it formed part of the communication and feedback process with the partners I worked on at the time. Because, uh, you know, there was a couple where there was a lack of meeting attendance on one, for example, and we talked about it. And, and it wasn't malicious. It was just sometimes he felt it, it wasn't something he could do. And so we just talked about professional expectation and, and things like that. And I've, I found that, yeah, quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, May, you've got a question. 
Yes, um, really interesting. Thank you. Fascinating. I think I can speak on behalf of the group I was in. We were wondering, how did you promote this to students? Because from the academic side, I can see a lot of benefits, but the student side, what did they see? I mean, they're not paid for this. It's you know completely voluntary. What did they see as the, the benefit, the, the outcome, the, the direct impact, other than the, I am genuinely interested in caring about you know what's going on around me, but what was that? How was it um, promoted? That's what I'd like to find out. Um, I might let the students answer first and say why they applied and what they hoped to get out of it and what they have, and then I can talk about <laughs> what we tried to do. I might share some of my um, yes. uh, ideas. So, um, uh, firstly, I think I'm really involved within the university. Like um, some of the things we said or recommended is actually changing as we can see the result change like for example the website the, the interface of the website is actually changed and uh, personally because i'm studying design and i do a lot of user experience um like research so it's actually helping me to um, use what i learned in my major in a more workforce um practical aspect yeah As for me, I think um, the reason why I applied actually is, was, sorry, was genuinely to, I guess, improve the resources. Um, so there's that. Um, but I guess uh, it was also to challenge myself. I had heard that the academic skills unit offered opportunities to students to co-facilitate sessions, which is what I did end up doing. Um, and I found that that really boosted my confidence because a year ago when I first started uni, I was not confident at all. Um, so I found that really helpful as, um, as well as the professional development sessions that we got offered as well during the program. So, yeah. For me, it was the ability um, to work with staff members because I study science and a lot of my assessments and a lot of my coursework is based on individual um, research, individual learning. So I felt like it was a very good opportunity to see how professional staff work in that sort of setting. And also being able to collaborate with other students as the program is not uh, restricted to a certain course or certain um, type of student. So it has um, students from, as I think, since it's from biomedicine, we have design so there's a lot of different um, backgrounds and educational systems that they're used to so I think it's the um, reward of being able to see how different students work and face issues and break them down so that was what um, I liked about the program thank you um, that's great to hear <laughs> uh, we, we know we're always getting the altruistic students especially with voluntary programs um, yeah, we tend, we market this as, I think the tagline is, do you want to have a say in how the university supports students um, to develop their study, study skills and gain valuable employability skills is kind of the, the two pronged approach. So we've got the real altruistic, but also, hey, you can get something like this for your CV as well. Um, and that it seems to, seems to, to work. And we tried not to be judgy about, you know, what motivation student have for joining the program that everyone is uh everyone is welcome yeah absolutely um i can see a question just uh, uh from teresa did students get course credit for volunteering i'll just answer that now no okay no they don't um we have just launched a program at melbourne uni called melbourne plus um which is like a um, co-curricular program credentialing um, and we are a part of that. So students will now get recognition for participating in the program through that, which is great. Um, but previously we've just offered to be referees and um, given them a certificate. Um, Morag, uh, Carolyn asks, could you give us a couple of examples of products? What, what has been produced? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I will just, I'll put in the chat, that's a link to our students as partners page. Um, and if you, um, we've got a list of um, projects and resources. Actually, I'll share this one. This is the resource one. 
Uh, so feel free to have a have a rummage through here. We haven't updated it um, for this year, um, but we've got a list here of some of the things we worked on, and this was um, during the shift to online learning. We have, for example, some web pages that uh, students developed entirely by themselves. So um, with a little bit of training around how to write for the web, um, and then we've put together you know, some tips and advice on writing effective emails, um, managing time in online study, tips for learning from online recordings. So we've got some web pages there. We have a huge suite of video projects. There was a massive project. Um, I think Ariana and then and Steve coordinated this enormous video project that students worked on. That was great. Um, they were really good. Yeah, and I think you can see them all on our YouTube channel. Mm. Uh, but there are also some of the projects on here. Um, we've worked on online sort of reflective tools. This is a Qualtrics form developed by um, a colleague of ours. They've worked on sort of UX projects as well. Um, I can't show you the hub, unfortunately, because it's behind a, behind a login. Well, I can, but it would take me a while to log in. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's an example of some of the things that, that we've, um, we've created with them. Um, there are other things. I think one of the really interesting projects this semester, Ha's working, I'm not sure if she's here, um, is working with some students to do some research on intercultural communication um, and English as an international language. And they're hoping eventually to get a publication out of that. So yeah, a few examples there. Real breadth, real breadth of program. Yeah. Yeah. A real variety of interest as well. And just on the video program, because it's the one I had most involvement with, along with the orientation programs, but <clears throat> we thought we could incorporate student voice into some of the videos, some of the time. They ended up being complete student voice all the time. <laughs> they were all student, and it came out so well. They were, I hope this happens at your institutions too, but our students keep positively and pleasantly surprising us at how good they are and how capable they are. I'm not just saying it because three of them were here, <laughs> but they're always so good at this stuff. It's it's great. And they fly when given a little bit of direction and a chance to do well. And they they do, they rise to the occasion. I'd be interested in hearing from, or I, hopefully we would be interested in hearing from any other institutions. Does anybody want to tell us what, just give us a quick couple of minutes summary about any similar programs at your place? Anyone got a flagship program they want to trumpet? I think Freya, go, go ahead, Freya. Yes. Hello, my name's Freya and I'm an academic skills and language advisor at La Trobe University. And I thought this might be an interesting one to share because it does have some similarities with what you're doing and, and some differences. So we do partner with students to work on our resources, but these are our students who are employed by La Trobe. So we have our peer learning advisors or PLAs and their key role is to be available either Zoom or on campus at the PLA desk. And they're available for drop-in support from students who want help with their academic skills or their learning. Um, but we found that um, the PLAs do spend a lot of time sitting and waiting for a student to come in. And the feedback that we got from them was we spend a bit of time waiting around and particularly after COVID, that, that became more of something we were noticing. So we began to work, actually the idea came from the PLAs themselves. What about having a weekly task on shift where we can work on something for the library or for the university and then we can review resources, we can make workshops, things like that. So that's what we've been doing as of this year and it's been working really well. I had a great conversation with Cheryl in the breakout room, who's who's one of um, you know one of your student partners, and she said how the the best work comes when they have more auto auto autonomy, <laughs> pardon me, and um, can make more decisions. And the starting from scratch that Morag spoke about, Morag, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, that that Morag spoke spoke about, and um, that's what we found as well. So when we started out this program, we were just saying. Um, can you give us some feedback on this? Can you have a look at that and tell us if it's working? And then more and more we found, you know, that if we said we want to create a brand new workshop, 
what topics do you think students want to know about? And then let it come from there and then they create the workshops with guidance and support from staff. So really over this year, we've just been learning that the more and more that we involve students um, from the beginning, the, the more worthwhile it is for everyone. And we, we sort of have an advantage where our PLAs are very accessible because they are employed by the university and they're on shift. So that's, I was really interested um, to learn more from Cheryl about motivations for doing this because we still want it to feel like something that they want to do during the downtime in their shift. We don't want it to feel like a, like a chore or, or busy work. So that was really good to, to hear that. So I've loved this session and yeah, thank you. Thanks Freya, great, um, great input. Love to hear that. Um, Matt from ACU Online. Hey, I wanted to share something. It's not at ACU Online. It's uh, something I worked on at Swinburne before I started this role, but um, I worked with a bunch of student leaders to set up something called the Swinburne Leadership Hub. The really interesting part of that was the students sort of approached me with the idea and it was really wonderful saying, well, let's start something new and, and you guys pitch the project you want, pitch the program that's going to make sense to you. I almost treated it as like I was their mentor, coach, like business mentor. And it was so sort of just trying to channel and direct their energy and ideas and help them develop a really strong case for what they wanted rather than, you know, sort of just taking 10% or 15%, um, but really trying to say, well, do, I'll show you how I design a program and, and you have a go and see what you come up with. And let's see if we can get the university to say yes. Um, so it sort of turned into a, a way of students, you know, to connect, to work together, but also to keep the dialogue open with the university um, at kind of a programmatic level, you know, instead of saying like, these are the policy issues we care about, which there were good avenues for, it was a way for students saying like, you know, we, we want more workshops around this, but we don't want to work out who to talk to. We just want to tell you what's going to work and, and give you some examples and maybe we can run it. Um, and like a lot of people, we couldn't pay the students, but I found that the opportunity to work really closely with staff, get to know them, uh, be really listened to and to have a lot of agency, you know, we, we couldn't keep the students away. Um, I think when you're sort of in a big class of five, 10,000, and then you suddenly are in a really small tight knit group where you feel heard and seen and appreciated. Mm. I mean, we all know what that's like. We've all worked in places where we feel like we're connected and it feels amazing. We've all worked in places where you stacking shelves and nobody would know if you did the job or you didn't. So um, for those of us that maybe work in environments where the resources are a bit tight at that time, I think there's still really good ways to give students something they're not getting in other places that's really valuable. Although it would be better if we could also pay them too, I suppose. It's it's worth noting that <laughs> Melbourne Uni isn't entirely... Um, no, no, I wasn't just talking about Melbourne. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. I feel, <laughs> feel the need to defend ourselves. We have had Absolutely. an internship program where we've paid students uh, and we've run that for a few years. So we actually have... Um, a, a program like that too. Um, thanks, Matt. Uh, Robin, let's hear from you. I'm actually hoping that Tom or Megan are here and will come on as well because um, they're two of my colleagues at Deakin who have been involved in a Students as Partners project this year and last year within their um, maths program because um, we, we have a, um, a Students as Partners um, area within the Office of the Dean of Students. And we have a variety of styles of interactions you could use from that. Um, some of them are paid, some of them are volunteer. Megan or Tom, are you there at all? And yep, here to, here, here to back you up, Robin. Yep, Thanks. keep <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, thanks. Uh, yep, thanks for the opening the door, Robin. Well done. Um, yeah, our um, Student as Partners program has been running about 18 months now. And uh, it works uh, predominantly in the maths area to develop maths modules uh, in areas of need as identified by lecturers in some cases, and in other cases as identified by our maths mentors during their um, drop-in sessions. Uh, during the drop-in sessions, maths mentors record uh, the problems um, that students come with. We've got a bank of, uh, you know, going back um, several years of uh, 
uh, spreadsheets. So we were able to extract information from those spreadsheets and from the lecturers in order to um, ascertain what the needs were. And then we, uh, as of 18 months ago, we began to develop these modules as a student as partner project. Uh, in our cases, the, um, the student partners are paid. And in fact, in the breakout room, we had quite a discussion. And in fact, the entire discussion was based on this idea of voluntary and paid roles. And um, I think what came out of that discussion was that in many ways, if you want a representative, a wide representative of students to be involved in these partnerships, then really, you really have to think about it being a paid role because um, otherwise you might have a situation where, you know, the, let's say the privileged students who don't need to work are able to do this voluntarily, whereas those students who need to work part-time elsewhere in order to uh, support themselves may not have um, have time to to be involved in these uh, programs if they are on a voluntary basis. So, you know, you, you come into quite a, an ethical area here in relation to voluntary as opposed to uh, paid roles in these SAP projects. Now, and our SAP, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, Tom, my experience with my SAP project is I have all volunteers and our retention hasn't been there like it would have been if it was a paid role because they see it as a, as a job, um, even though it, it, it is and it isn't um, because it is generally a short-term thing, but you keep going. Yep. yep, no, that's right. Well, we also mentioned that, sure, if, if a, a SAP project is perhaps, you know, four, six or eight hours during a course of a trimester, yep, you, you probably, you know, fair enough, you might get students who are quite prepared to do that on a voluntary basis. Uh, but our SAP projects are, are certainly longer than that, as our, our Maths Mentors program, they uh, entail, you know, many more hours during uh, the trimester than six, eight or ten. So, you know, they are paid roles and um, we uh, there's extensive training that takes place um, in um, the process of, our, you know, post-selection process, the training that takes place um, in order for the partners to, uh, to be aware of um, what the role constitutes and to come aboard um, as true partners. And as we said in this uh, breakout room, um, a true partnership, we the professionals are paid why shouldn't the, the partners be paid if they are in the spirit of uh, you know, a true partnership? Um, so they come aboard and uh, they, uh, you know, we um, uh, canvas their opinions and their input into the structure of the module, the content, um, into the um, review of the module as it's evolving um, into its final iteration. So they do have an active partnership role from the beginning through to the uh, final uploading of the module uh, to students across the university. Wow, <clears throat> that sounds great, uh, Tom. Thanks, thanks a lot, Robin. Were you going to add something before I? No, no, no. go for it. <laughs> oh, great! I just wanted to say thank you for the contribution. That's uh, it. Sounds like there's things going on around. Um, and somebody, sorry, I didn't quite catch who it was. Uh, Matthias Pat posted in chat about a UCLA program, which is apparently brilliant. Their resources are brilliant. So there's a link there that you can check out. Um, okay, uh, we're nearly we're nearly at time, um, but we've got a little few more minutes for any other questions you might have for either Morag or the students. Um, I've got one if no one, I've got another one if no one hasn't. Um, I would be interested to hear what the students think about the, um, you know, like sometimes I think when a formerly junior partner comes to a relationship and has a set of neat expectations about what I can do, and it's it's kind of comfortable in some ways. And when the expectations or the responsibility rises, how did you feel about that? Like if we're saying, rather than just put in a couple of things to a presentation or a workshop, I want, I want you now to co-create it. How, how did you feel about that? Was that something in your comfort zone or something which you had to really make your own shift about? Tinsu or Cheryl? Or yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think for me, it was a bit of a shift because traditionally it was very much just feedback oriented and that would be it. Um, 
I think as soon as people or as soon as staff say the word co-create, um, I think it sort of imposes a sense of responsibility that you have to, I guess, put your effort in and do it well. Mm. Um, and in that sense, I guess it's sort of that type of initiative you would expect, even if it was a paid job. So I think it's still there. And I think it was certainly a transition for me. Um, but yeah, I guess aside from that, yeah, it was a, a transition for me to move into, I guess, um, working with staff and making sure that my contribution was good and it was valid and it was enough um, and that it would count on the day of that presentation, I think. Yeah. I would definitely agree with Tin Su because I feel exactly the same. And also um, when I started like planning out this whole, for example, workshop from the beginning, I feel more confident in the end, just talking about it to the students. So yeah, it's better, uh, more comfortable way for me to um, do my contributions, yeah. Another thing is that a lot of the projects with staff is not just an individual student and a staff member, it's a group of students. So you probably wouldn't feel as stressed uh, from the get go. And another thing was how they facilitated the um, meetings. So the staff members are really accommodating and they allowed us to pick uh, when we were flexible and the whole platform of using Teams and being able to um, see how different members thought about the project or um, different insights was already quite friendly to me. Um, so I felt that that made the transition a lot easier for me to adapt to. Excellent. Um... Carolyn and uh, Rebecca have been posting, as well as Sally, have been posting in chat that um, it'd be great for people to consider submitting uh, more egg. This could be you uh, <laughs> submitting some of this work to uh, the journal, the the article, the journal, uh, the old journal. It'd be great. We'd love to um, see uh, read about some uh, this sort of work there. And Sally Ashton Hay also talks about the Journal of University Teaching and Learning Practice. Would also be interested. Um, perhaps well. End it almost there. Morag, what would be the the takeaway you'd like to leave us with in terms of the program learnings for you? Oh. Um <laughs> that was a question without notice, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um I think that the main takeaway for me is shifting the way that you work with students requires. So I'm sure you've noticed a lot more potential, a lot more time, energy, effort. I, I think, you know, any one of us could pick up a, you know, it, it 10 minutes before a workshop, run in, teach it, come out, you know, without much prep. But the process of going through workshop preparation with students and starting from scratch every time takes, you know, four or five hours, something, something like that. But so the resourcing and the time that goes into it is greater, but the benefit is, is so great. Uh, so I think I think that's how to sort of approach it. Uh, be careful with the projects and the things that you commit to because it does take more time and you need to have a structure and a manager that supports the team in doing that. And you have to be willing to put more in to get more out. Yes. Oh, uh, I couldn't agree more. It's It's been a great three years of learning for us as a team and uh, led by you. Uh, it's It's fantastic. Um, can you guys all join me in thanking uh, Morag, uh, Tinsu, Annie, and Cheryl in presenting another fantastic Connect Inspire session to us. Um, if you can just give us a bit of time in evaluating it, the link is in chat. Uh, I've just posted it in there. Um, our next one, we haven't got a firm date for it yet, but it'll be in September, most likely. Um, and then later in the year, we, we're hoping to put on a symposium, uh, a, a longer uh, piece with, um, uh, but more about that uh, when we have more details around it. So on behalf of myself, um, Alice, who's here, Alice Lee, May, and uh, I think Tiana might have gone. Uh, that's the PD committee for all. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. And please feel free to reach out if you've got other questions.